Welcome to another episode of Let Go and Lead, where we discuss the new realities of leadership with pioneers, provocateurs, and passionate leadership champions. Today, I'm chatting with Jeremy Dean, CEO of Elephants and Riders in New Zealand, and the creator of the Emotional Culture Deck, which is a tool for leaders to explore the emotions of their employees. I appreciate how Jeremy talks about emotions. As we look to change and transform our companies, having conversations around them is vital. So get comfortable and get ready to let go and lead. Well, Jeremy, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, you know, I'm so impressed with the work you're doing on emotional culture and all the tools that you've developed. What was the journey that led you to that? Well, a sort of a serendipitous one that involved a lot of uh, good luck and good fortune. But I was originally working for a design agency here in Wellington, New Zealand. And I started out as the assistant to the boss, to the boss man, his personal assistant. And uh, I was learning my craft in the design world and the strategy world, but finding it overwhelming and complicated. And I was really interested in how I simplified the conversations we're having, because I thought at times they were overcomplicated and potentially they needed to be complicated because we were charging so much. And there was that old adage around consulting, the more you charge, the more value you provided. And I didn't think that was quite accurate. <laughs> I stumbled across some really interesting card games or card tools from some companies in the in the US. In the US, I think Chicago actually as well. You know, and one of them was called the Brand Deck. And the Brand Deck, it raised about $200,000 on Kickstarter. And I thought, well, okay, there's a market here for interesting card tools that help people simplify conversations. And this particular game called the Brand Deck helped people have a conversation as a team about what their ideal brand was. And at the time, we were doing a lot of work in, in the value space, corporate values, workplace culture and corporate values. And I thought we were overcomplicating that, making it very difficult. And I looked at this brand deck game and thought, I wonder if there's a way I could create a card game to, to help a team have a conversation around the values of their organization. So this was brand deck. It was like a deck of cards. Is what... uh, a small set playing pack of cards yep, yep. that you would okay. flip through and there was about 100 attributes in it. And I thought, imagine if you put, 100 values cards in, in a pack of cards and you got everybody together and everybody had a chance to to choose what they believed the values were for the organization. And I designed a game called the Customer Experience Deck, which was 100 feelings, 100 emotions in a pack of cards. And you would answer this core question, which was how do you want your customers to feel and not feel? Because my deduction was if we can come to consensus as a team, organization or team, about how we want our customers to feel and not feel, then we can have a conversation about how we're going to nudge or encourage our customers to feel the, the pleasant emotions and not feel the unpleasant ones. And then once we've done that work, we can then concentrate on how we now define the brand. Because if a brand is an experience, an experience is something you feel, then why don't we have a conversation about the emotion side of it? And that game was the first game I designed under Riders and Elephants. And I took the working prototype to a friend in Auckland, which is a city here in New Zealand, just a little bit away from us. And she works in people, people and culture. She's the head of culture for a big multinational organization here in New Zealand. And she looked at the game and said, I love this, but I don't have customers. My customers are my people. And I really love that thought because I just then in that moment switched the core question from what do we want our customers to feel to what do we want our people to feel? And based on that, a leader could come together with their team and say, what do we want our people to feel and not feel? And now as a leadership group, as an organization, how can we encourage our people to feel the pleasant emotions and not feel or manage the unpleasant emotions? And then weirdly and serendipitously like this world works, there was an article on the HBR called Manage Your Emotional Culture, mm -hmm. which stopped me in my tracks because I'd just been having a conversation about emotions and culture, which I hadn't expected to have. But it turned out there was a concept and there is a thing called emotional culture. And this research came out of Wharton and George Mason universities from Seagal Bassard and Olivia O'Neill. And you know, when you're reading something, there's always like one line or a paragraph that just sticks with you. And it has for seven years now. And it said most organizations underestimate the impact of emotions on their culture. And that struck me because up until that moment, we'd only ever talked about values and behaviors when it came to corporate culture. 
we had not once ever in the six years I was working in this space mentioned the word emotion when it came to culture. And it goes on to say that in their research, they've discovered that there's two parts to culture. There's emotional culture and cognitive culture. Cognitive culture being um, how we think and how we behave. Emotional culture being what people feel and don't feel in the workplace. And from that article, from that insight, from the game I created, I shifted it to become about emotional culture and helping leaders become aware and be intentional about the emotions that exist or that they either encourage or conversely, some leaders don't even know, but suppress in the workplace. And so this card game suddenly turned into a, a whole universe of conversations about workplace emotions and for leaders and people within them. We talk to our clients a lot about how people's feelings affect their thinking, their thinking affects their beliefs, and their beliefs is what impacts their behavior. There we go. So you can't just change behavior. You have to influence belief. And belief does come from how people feel about things. And that's the insight I had and, and continue to have is that in the work I was doing, like I mentioned, we, we would always begin with values. When we came in to talk about culture within the organization, we'd sit down. The first conversation was values. And then we'd shift to, okay, what behaviors do we need to reinforce those values? And we right, never touched right. on emotion. We never went there. That was a taboo. There's no ROI. It's a waste of time. All these sorts of things. Would, you imagine I've faced over seven years of, of talking about emotion in the workplace. But ironically, human behavior works in the other way. Emotion governs how we behave. Our behaviors reinforce our belief set or our value set. And so what we've ended up doing is flipping the traditional consulting model, I guess, of going values, behaviors, not talk about emotions and starting the conversation about workplace culture culture with emotion, then having a discussion around what behaviors will reinforce the emotions we would like to see and the ones we want, that the unpleasant ones we know will exist, that we don't want to suppress, but we want to help people manage. And then let's have a conversation around what that means for our value set, our belief set, what we believe about to be true about the world. I think it's so interesting also because so many companies shy away from talking about the more unpleasant emotions, and yet they're some of the most important ones to help people get out. We need to give people the tools to express themselves because there's a strange there's a strange phenomenon, and I get this all the time, and we still get it, is that I don't want to have a conversation about emotion because I'm worried about what will come out of it. And weirdly, that's that's the fear of the leader. That's the, They're expressing a fear that they're not sure how to manage it or they are concerned that something will happen. But there's a strange phenomenon that when we express unpleasant emotion, it actually reduces the unpleasantness of the experience because we're moving from the limbic system into the prefrontal cortex and all of a sudden we're able to, to think, we're able to think about them in a different way and reframe them. So talking about unpleasant, expressing unpleasant emotion in the workplace is extremely important because it actually helps our people experience them in a less intense and less unpleasant manner. I chuckle on the inside when people say we don't want to have this conversation because we're worried about what might come from it, not realizing that having the conversation, I think, is a duty upon us as a leader because it's going to be helping our people, not hindering them. What I've come to realize, I think my very biggest insight over the seven years is that people want to talk about emotion, they just don't know how. We don't have the labels, we don't have the words to describe or express these words. You might have you might have had this when you ask a friend, how do you feel, or how are you, and you get good or not so great. If you're lucky and you ask somebody how they feel, you might get happy, mad, sad, or glad, some really high-level ones, but you'll never get any more granular, granular than that. People just don't have the labels. And so our game is simply that. There's 87 different emotions or feeling states within our card set, within the playing cards. And we give people those labels so they can work through them and card sort and whistle them down to the most important ones that they would like to feel and not feel as a leader or as an employee. Plus also you have the conversation as a leader and select the cards that you would like your people to feel and not feel within the workplace. But the hardest part of all this is giving people the labels because if you don't have the words to express yourself, you can't create connection, you can't be vulnerable, uh, you can't get a deeper understanding of yourself or one another. So it sounds 
simple and it is simple because our game is simply made up of 87 emotion labels plus a series of steps you go through to whittle down to the most important and at the end of that you've discovered or defined the things that you want your people to feel and not feel and the things that you need to feel to be successful but also the things you don't want to feel but you might experience in the workplace from time to time and how did you narrow it down to the 87 such a great question so we over two years of development of this game i think we got to version 15 before we launched it following very much a human-centered design uh, approach where the very first version i think had about 147 emotions in the pack of cards and i had originally been following a fellow called dr philip shaver he's an emotion scientist and he'd done a whole bunch of work on how we identify emotions in one another, specifically in the faces, facial expressions. And so I'd taken his work and the list of emotions that he had found and, uh, and put them into the game originally. But what I found through early testing was that giving people a list of 147 emotions was quite overwhelming and paralyzing. And over time, over the testing over four years, I ended up with a list of about 87, which are the ones that were picked on average more um, and ones that resonated with people a lot more than some of the ones that were in the original list. So it was just a process of, of testing, iterating, um, and whittling it down with users around the world over two years before we officially launched. And I understand the aspect of a card sort as people are sorting through which emotions might most resonate with them. Why do you call it a game? Yeah, so one, to be a little bit provocative, Having a conversation about emotion in the workplace is not generally accepted by a lot of people. It's still a taboo. It's still a, I get things like, I remember in a really early workshop I ran, I had a guy in the, in the boardroom table with his feet up looking at me and this game and saying, I don't have emotions, mate. All I feel is contempt and apathy for the world. And <laughs> I'm not particularly with you, but I quickly retorted with, well, you do feel two things, contempt and apathy. And he goes, oh, okay, maybe I do feel. Or I've had other leaders, really powerful, um, successful leaders say, I don't care how my people if and feel. I just want them to do their if and job. And so these are the responses we come across and, we've, and, the, and the obstacles we face. My way of counteracting that was to, was to change the frame of reference for this conversation. It's not about the scientific method that's going to help us achieve X, Y, Z. It's about playing and exploring and all of a sudden, people tend to lean into it a bit more because it's just a game. And now I've got permission to have a play rather than dissect myself emotionally and psychologically and, and find a new uh, paradigm for, for leadership development. Like those sorts of words attached to emotion then become sirens, red lights saying, don't go here. I'm afraid of this. I've been taught not to lean into it. Whereas by calling it a game and really accentuating the play aspect because we play with cards all of a sudden um, there's less there's less threat there's more permission to play mm -hmm. and it becomes a it becomes a different frame of reference for the conversation that we might normally have in the workplace so tell me about your company's name the rider and the elephant i assume it comes from a parable that we both probably have read it has indeed it has indeed so a book that has been incredibly influential in my career is called a switch how to change when change is hard and it's by the dan and chip heath brothers and for anybody who's working in change this needs to be a book that's on your reading list in your bible of of books and they popularized the work of a guy called jonathan Haidt, a social psychologist and he came up with the metaphor of the the writer and the elephant for our emotions and how we behave the writer being the rational mind our cognitive mind and the elephant being our emotional self and if anybody out there is listening um, at the moment close your eyes and imagine a picture of a person on top of an elephant and you can start to see the disparity in size and control and the metaphor is that the writer is the one trying to control our emotions but the, the elephant is really unruly it gives us energy and drive and motivation the writer gives us direction and long-term planning and thinking and so I've taken that metaphor unashamedly, stolen it, and named our business after it. Yes, and if I remember the story correctly, it talks about the writer, the ego, believing that 
the rider can be in control and the rider can as long as it's where the elephant wants to go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which it, I love. It, it sounds- <laughs> Yeah, at times we believe we're in control when we're, we're when we're completely out of control. And through time, we've used animal metaphors to describe the human human behavior. And I think about the work I'm doing is going, how do we help people control their elephants? We often talk about the fact that organizations don't really transform; people do. And I'm really curious how you feel that these tools that you're using help people transform in a direction that could be helpful for their organization. Yeah, it's so true. It's, you don't change the system, you change the people within the system who then go on to change the system. And that's what I believe anyway. Uh, but when it comes to change or trans- transformation of any kind is change, whether it's large change or small change. And when I think about change, I think about the quote that change is not a decision of the mind, but of the heart. And too often when it comes to transformation or change, we're really great at having a conversation or building the structures for the functional aspect of change but we always mostly overlook or neglect the emotional aspect of change and I think that's a really important thing to consider when you're using our game or you're thinking about change is that how do we want our people to feel through this change what are the emotions holding our people back from the transformation we're seeking what are the emotions that are going to motivate that transformation or that change we're not great at having that conversation once again, full circle because we're not great at expressing ourselves, or we don't think we sh- we don't think that conversation matters. Yet the majority of change will fall over because of the the high intense unpleasant emotions that people are experiencing as they go through that transformation. But we're not having that conversation. We're not inviting our people to express themselves and help to help us as leaders understand what those emotions might be that they're experiencing. And so. If we want to help people to change, to build the systems and to help with that transformation, we need to be having a discussion about the emotions that people are experiencing in the workplace. Otherwise, we set ourselves up for failure. No system will survive uh, the, the collective affect, the collective emotion if it's unpleasant of the people within the system. It's like the old adage, the saw stuff is the hard stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, yeah exactly. most organizations try to avoid it. So I think it's terrific that you've given them these tools. What is it about the tools that you think is different than what other approaches have been? Great question. I think the difference is the simplicity of this conversation, but also the element of the play, because it's suddenly inviting a broader group of people into this but also we're truly helping people express themselves. And because there is such a high level of unpleasant, sometimes high intense emotion within workplaces that hasn't been expressed or we haven't invited people to share, when they're playing this game and when leaders especially are playing this game, they're going through a process of self-discovery and self-awareness that you wouldn't go through if you're only ever diagnosing or creating a culture change system based on qualitative and quantitative data. And so the human aspect of of getting leaders together in the room with their employees to learn, connect, and grow, but especially express themselves at an emotional level is something that I don't think a lot of people have tapped into, mainly because of those fears that I mentioned that people have about what's going to come from that conversation. It's easier to design values posters and values videos and do a roadshow around the country saying how great we are and talking about these beliefs we have. It's a lot, seemingly has been a lot more difficult to actually get to the core of what matters, which uh, how are our people feeling and how do we need them to feel to be successful? I would imagine there has to be great power in the fact that when people see the cards and they see those words on the cards, they're actually being given permission to say, this is how I feel because it's on the card. So it must be okay. (laughs) Exactly right. Yeah. Permission is a huge part of this. We give people permission to express themselves, to, to share how they are feeling or how they'd like to feel. Inadvertently, there's also the element of people sharing what they're not feeling because if they're not picking certain cards, we're also learning about the unpleasant emotions that are, that are present or not present. Um, in this game. So permission is huge, but different and completely different from the permission you get when you're in a workshop or you're working in a project where you ask people to to describe what they think the values of the organization are. 
at one level that's a little bit um removed because i've been in so many sessions where where uh where we've been asked what do i i've been asked personally what do i think the values of our organization are and i've given my I've given my perspective on it and then the senior leadership has gone away and come back and then none of the things that I've ever said have been ended up in the final result for obvious reasons because a leadership group or a leader of an organization can't include everybody's perspective in there but that activity itself breeds cynicism because you've come to me and asked me what I think but then replay back to me something that includes nothing none of my perspective and so immediately I'm creating a divide or a, or a, or a gap between the organization and the employee and our game starts with self it always starts with self so through our game i will start by exploring what i need to feel and not feel as an individual to be successful so it starts with me before we shift to okay now what do we need to feel as an organization or as a team and by starting with self that session leaves an impact on you because i've got a chance to explore what is important to me first at emotional level before we shift to the collective and so I think there's a there's a difference in the approach and how we engage people which removes the cynicism that can exist in a traditional value setting exercise. Well, and I think it also gives people agency in the process in that many times I think there's such a focus on the organization that we forget that the organization is simply a collective of individuals and having people really own what they need to feel actually encourages them to help make it happen yeah exactly right and it reminds me that i'm a huge believer in subcultures within organizations i think subculture has been a dirty word for a long time for a lot of people and we want to have this homogenous one-way top-down activity of of culture setting or value setting but our game is very much built on bottom up so starting with individual self then moving to subculture at a team level before you have a conversation about the whole uh, because the marketing team will be vastly and naturally should have a vastly different subculture from the engineering team and from the finance team. And let's not suppress that. Let's celebrate that and give that team agency over that, the, the subculture they want to create. All the while still finding a link back to the whole, to the greater um, organization, but not saying that you as the marketing team need to adhere strictly to this whole and we're going to suppress everything else, the emotions, the way that you behave, um, because we don't think it aligns. So I think there's huge scope to use this game to help articulate subcultures and get buy-in engagement that way too. I would imagine listeners are wondering, well, you go through a card sword, you pick emotions, like how I want to feel, how I don't want to feel. But what then takes that conversation into an actionable shift in culture? Yeah, so an, an example of where this has been a game changer for a client or where we've seen profound impacts from using the game. Yes, exactly. Those have come from the organizations who are who are using it mainly to solve really big, gnarly problems where teams or groups of people feel disenfranchised within an organization. And so there's probably there's probably three examples I'll touch on touch on for you. And the first one is for a cricket organization. So cricket is our form of baseball in New Zealand here. And I used to be a professional cricketer. So I know the game well, and I've worked for a long time with the organization here. And traditionally, cricket environments aren't the place where you're supposed to express yourself as a player, you're supposed to keep, keep your emotions under, under your hat, and not express yourself and and not share what you're experiencing. Which is the greatest irony, because Emotion drives how we behave and gives us the motivation to perform well, but we're not allowed to express ourselves. And we started working with one of the state teams here in New Zealand, the female team, and they'd gone through a really tumultuous time, losing their coach, a lot of disconnect with the players, and and I was asked to come in to use this game to help them. And in fact, the board at the time were uncertain that this was the right approach. In this team at the time, they were worried that talking about emotion would create more trouble, more challenges, more issues. And my my belief and my hypothesis was that this was the time that we needed to bring the team together. And so we went through a process of bringing these female cricketers together to help them understand what they'd experienced previously through the toxic time that they'd experienced, but then set intentions for how they wanted to define their environment moving forward from an emotional perspective. And it is amazing to see players um, connect 
open up and be vulnerable with each other for the first time and how all of a sudden that new understanding of each other paves a way forward because previously people weren't able to understand or be aware of what was happening within that team. And so these little moments um, add up, in, in my belief, to, to building great culture because having these conversations consistently over time build connections, they build rapport, they build understanding. I've also seen this this game and this conversation about emotions in the workplace work with sea boat captains, fishermen. So a large fishing organization where they played this game with the captains of these ships, of these boats. And so in my mind to begin with, and from outside looking in, sea captains of seafaring vessels which go thousands of kilometers out to sea, they're the antithesis of the type of person who would lean into this conversation. And there's a fracture within the organization, especially between the, the skippers of the boats and the organization. And do you know the number one thing that those those skippers, the boat skippers came back with saying that they wanted to feel? They needed to feel to be successful, and it was love. That's wonderful, yeah. Which blew me away. These captains, these typically from the outside, looking in, um, staunch male um, skippers of these boats said that they need to feel love from their organization within their environment to be successful in their work. And that human moment there is, is huge because the leaders of that organization, the ones on shore in the corporate office, take that and go, okay, what can we actually do to help these 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 people, these humans feel love in their job, which is always so disconnected from us as a corporate office. Have you found that uh, there's been a heightened awareness of emotion over the last couple of years? I think COVID has, COVID has intensified all of the emotions that already existed within workplaces. So emotion has been in workplace forever by the nature of humans being within workplaces. Right. From my perspective and from what I've seen, it's just intensified it's intensified the emotions, especially the high, intense, unpleasant ones. More of those have become prevalent. But importantly, what I've what I've noticed anyway is that more people are willing to to lean into the conversation now because of that. The one in our country, anyway, at least, and the one good thing that's happened is people have been open to having this conversation because we've gone through this shared experience, which has been so difficult and challenging. And that's given a lot of people permission to go okay, maybe we should care a little bit about their emotional state and their well-being now. So they're heightened. The emotions are heightened, which means it's more challenging. But the good thing is there's more permission now. Whether or not you're using our game or a game like it, there's people generally are more acceptable or accepting of the conversation as a whole, which I I think is really reassuring and, and makes me feel quite hopeful that that we can make a dent and have an impact in this space. Yeah, we're seeing corporations having conversations they'd never had before about well-being, about mental health, about all of these things, which I think is really important. Yeah, and often often these extremely traumatic events can trigger or can can spark a different way of looking at things if we if we're able to nudge the conversations that we'd like to and if we're able to to flip that conversation to help people express that and then say what do we need to shift from that state? but then apply it directly to the workplace, not just our home life, because when you turn up to work, you don't leave yourself at home. People sometimes might have to, but you shouldn't have to because you're still a human being at home and you're a human being at work. Yet we don't encourage people to bring their full selves to the workplace. We say that you need to leave that at home or you should be somebody else there. You've got to be this type of person here. And that's a heavy cognitive and emotional and mental load to have that you have to be two different people at all times and I think our job is to help people come to be themselves at the place we work not to be somebody that they're not because it's hard enough doing our jobs as it is let alone when you have to do it pretending to be somebody you're not you know one thing I'm wondering Jeremy is how things have changed for you with so many people working remotely or or hybrid teams has that changed how you're working through the workshops and has it also I'm curious changed any of the results that you're getting from people the conversation in a hybrid workplace is even more even more important because on a day-to-day basis we're not surrounded by our people so we can't read the micro expressions on their face we can't read their body language because we're not sat side by side Um, we can't have those small moments of conversation that we might not have been expressing how we felt but we could feel it because emotion is contagious 
whether we want to believe it or not, we catch each other's emotions. You'll be catching mine now. The listeners will be catching mine. I'll be catching yours. So all that meant in terms of how we did it was that we had to be more deliberate and more consistent with checking in with each other. And now a check-in as a team is a small thing, but a significant one if it's done properly. If the check-in is only ever about what's on your to-do list and what you've completed and what you're going to do next week, we de- we don't get to connect at the human level. And so quite quickly, people started using this game more regularly and more consistently to go, how are you feeling right now? What is your current state? To give people the chance to have that conversation. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't matter from what I've seen and what I've done myself, it doesn't matter that it happens via Zoom. It's slightly more tiring because of our, the way our brain operates with our eyes, but the conversation itself is still the same. We're going to get together as a group to express how we are right now and how we'd like to be moving forward. That doesn't matter if it's happening via Zoom or if it's happening face to face. Naturally, just from a gameplay perspective, it's more difficult because part of me, cards are physical. The really inspired organization sent cards to their people in their remote workplaces, in their homes. We designed a way for this game to be played in a remote Um, virtual uh, world, not in the same interactivity, but just simply giving people the labels. So flashing all the labels, all the cards up on the screen, then giving people post-it notes to write these, to write them onto. There's a really interesting thing that happens uh, when um, you don't have cards is that how you recreate the cards. So writing (laughs) down the emotion free is the number one thing I want to feel in my work free. It still has, uh, it still has been for the last six years. But I write that down onto this piece of paper and now I'm now talking about this emotion free on this card or this piece of paper rather than just expressing it um, one to one. So there's small little hacks that we've designed and we encourage people to do to continue to have the conversation. But the insight still remains. We need to give people the labels. Once we give people the labels, they can express themselves. And that connection is is like you've never seen, you've never experienced um, in your workplace, at home, with your family. So the hybrid nature of it hasn't changed at all. The conversation is exactly the same. It's just done in a different medium. Thank you. So if you think about your employee journey from before the employee starts to their last day, there's a whole bunch of touch points that they go through. So when they're getting the offer, their first day, the first week, their first team meeting, um, at each of those touch points, how are we as an organization helping to support the desired emotions, the things we want our people to feel, and how what are we doing to help people manage the undesired ones at each of those touch points? And so realistically, you're taking a, a design thinking or a customer experience um, viewpoint to your employee experience and, and the environment, but we are being led by the emotions we would like to support and the ones we want to help people manage rather than just simply what we want people to do and not do. So like we do at Riders and Elephants, feeling free is the number one thing that we have at the heart of our culture that I want our people to feel. And so what are we doing on a regular basis at meetings, um, the way we manage our diaries on the first day, on birthdays, all of these touch points to help people feel free. And we've got a whole bunch of different things that we have around um, the way we structure our weeks, meeting free weeks, meeting free Mondays, um, giving people the autonomy, the freedom to work from wherever they like, whenever they like. These are driven by our desire as an organization to help people to feel free. So we've retrospectively engineered touch points to make sure that there's a chance that those emotions um, will be experienced by people. So thinking about your touch points, mapping them all against the emotions you'd like to to encourage and the ones you want to manage, if they do pop up, is a really powerful way to make this really concrete across the organization. No, I really like that. We do a lot of work in helping companies create roadmaps that are around what do you do at these individual touch points. So bringing the work that you've done and the emotional pieces into it would be really cool. Yeah, and I remember from my customer experience work and my in that previous role I mentioned, we would do a lot of customer journey mapping, but the emotion aspect of it would only ever be like a smiley face or a sad face. Where does it lie on that? So a very binary um, pleasant or unpleasant, or it'll be about the fourth or fifth question or the fourth or fifth section on the on the customer journey map, which meant that for me, it wasn't very prevalent. It wasn't really important because we're coming to it very last. But imagine if we started with that. So across those touch points, 
what are the emotions we want to encourage and support and what are the ones what are the unpleasant ones we know people will experience that we can help them manage so before your first day uncertainty fear on the first day we don't want people to feel unwelcome so what are we going to do to feel them welcome for instance so using the lens of emotion to drive the tactics the initiatives the activities that we create for our people yeah we have a process where we go through what do you want people to feel what do you want them to think and what do you want them to do mm. so therefore what do they have to feel <laughs> yeah 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 but there's yeah. so much there's so much nuance and if you can give people the words there's a lot of granularity that you can get to to help to help guide that rather than just we want them right. to feel good or bad or we don't want them to feel bad we want them to feel good for instance um what what does inspired look like how do we help our people feel inspired if that's a really important thing to us how do we help people feel connected or brave and how do we help people manage feeling alone especially in the hybrid workplace if alone might be a really important one that we don't want our people to feel but we know they might from time to time well how does that look at your workstation now if your workstation is in your bedroom so right all right. these things can be guided all those touch points can the design of those touch points can be guided um, by emotion if we if we start with it so jeremy as you know the title of this podcast is let go and lead and i'm curious to get your take on what you think leaders most need to let go of so i think leaders need to let go of their fear we're we're fearful of what might arise when we want to have this conversation about emotions in the workplace i see it time and time again the common response is we can't talk about that i'm not qualified to have that conversation i'm worried that that's going to trigger something that that we don't want we need as leaders to let go of that fear and and lean more into a state of curiosity and trust that there is there is huge benefit and value from connecting with another human being at an emotional level and you will get the most out of somebody you will understand somebody the most you will be able to be seen in a different light yourself as a leader if you can let go of your fear about what might happen and trust that your vulnerability to steal Brené Brown's words is your superpower and if you invite vulnerability in return that reciprocity that becomes a really special way to build connections and the culture within a team but too many of us unfortunately are afraid and we're not willing to leap into that unknown and so we need to let go of our fear that's brilliant thank you so much and thank you so much for being on let go and lead i really appreciate all of your insights well Mir, thank you very much for in inviting me on to you and your team Jeremy's story is fascinating because it didn't begin in the realm of culture it began in the realm of branding a chance encounter reading Harvard Business Review and a very provocative comment from a colleague who told him, I'm trying to understand colleagues and employees, started Jeremy on his exploration of emotions inside culture. Let's recap a few of the learnings. Talking about emotion is critical and shouldn't be taboo. When people are feeling unpleasant emotions in the workplace, they need an opportunity to express what they're feeling. As leaders, we need to build the systems to help with transformation by understanding what emotions our people are experiencing. At Gagan, we often talk about the fact that organizations don't really transform, people do. I completely agree with Jeremy's point that whether it's large or small, change comes down to a decision not just of the mind, but of the heart. In addition, Jeremy's thoughts on leaders needing to let go of fear is insightful. He notes that leaders may be fearful of what could arise when the teams talk about their emotions in the workplace. Jeremy recommends that leaders lean into a state of curiosity and that they trust there's a benefit and value to connecting at an emotional level. I appreciate Jeremy sharing his expertise on emotions in the workplace in this Let Go and Lead episode. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.